And here we go. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of The Big Idea. I am your host, Dr. Jeffrey Hanna, here with Clear Chiropractic in Spokane, Washington. And what we've got here today is going to be a slightly different kind of video. This one here was uh, in direct response to a request that somebody had asked me in the practice. They asked if I could do a video to show the kinds of exercises that could help you hold your adjustments better. So we know this is we don't want to have to keep doing from a chiropractic perspective the same adjustment over and over and over and over. Your body is designed to win. It doesn't make sense that things even with the accumulation of stress that we all have in our life that the thing should continuously go out of alignment every one to two weeks. It's like no our body should be more resilient than that. And the key to that is physical exercise. Exercise may cure nothing, but prevent everything, as one of my mentors oftentimes would say it. Now, I will also add that, you know, while we live on planet Earth, a planet with time, gravity, and stress, well, guess what? There's probably never going to be a circumstance where all we ever have to do is just do that one magic adjustment and it stays forever and ever. Yes, that's what we're aiming for. So in this video, what I'm going to be showing are a few of the exercises that help to maintain your overall strength, your flexibility, and then give your body the opportunity to rest and relax in the same way that ideally we're brushing our teeth at least once, but ideally twice every single day plus flossing. That's how we take good care of our teeth. In the same way, these are some of the exercises that you can be doing at home on your own in order to maintain your best alignment possible. So let's jump in and have a look at them. All right, so what we're going to preface by saying here is what we said in the introduction, and that is that when it comes to the maintenance and the strength of your neck, your spine, it's all about your core muscles. You hear this extensively from physical trainers, physical therapists, exercise physiologists, etc., etc. That's how important this is. Now, a lot of times people think that, okay, chiropractic, physical therapy, that these are different ways of actually accomplishing the same thing. Not necessarily. Because you see, from the chiropractic perspective, we're focusing on the joints and if they are moving the right way. And absolutely, yes, you need to have the strong intrinsic core muscles that maintain and facilitate that kind of movement. However, when there's a joint injury where that joint is locked in position, it doesn't matter how strong that muscle is, it's not going to be able to actually self-correct it in that particular regard. That's what the chiropractic adjustment is for. But in the same breath, if you don't have strong intrinsic core muscles, well, guess what? We can make that correction, but just as easily, it may be able to lock back out again. And so what we need, ideally, is both things coming together. I'm not going to pretend to be a physical therapist here, but what I want to showcase for you are some of the more basic kinds of exercises that you can be doing at home that are going to help in order to maintain your correction as well as possible. So I will emphasize first and foremost here that if you are nursing physical injuries, different things like that, always make sure that you are not just following this guy on the internet showing you these videos. Have the conversation first with your physical therapist, your chiropractor, your medical physician, whoever, to make sure that this is actually going to be appropriate for you. Now, it's going to be three kinds of general activities. So we want to be working on exercises that improve flexibility, exercises that increase strength, and then also exercises that actually allow things that opportunity to be able to relax. I'll emphasize the one first when it comes to strength and um, strength and maintaining that integrity there first and foremost. This video is not really going to be about those kinds of movements activities. Anything though that engages your core to where any part, whether it's your abdomen, whether it's back, whether it's the pelvic floor, provided that you are maintaining the correct orientation of your head on top of your shoulders, that's going to be good for you. And that's going to be the key, is that when you are doing physical activities that focus on strengthening, it is imperative that your head is sitting in the right place over top of your shoulders. Otherwise, you are not doing that exercise in a way that's going to develop the strength. A lot of times people want to know, 
what kind of exercises can I do to increase the strength of my neck? And here's the problem, is that the core muscles that support your C1, your C2 vertebrae in particular, they're not really designed for motion. They're more so designed as proprioceptive organs, sending your brain information about where your head is in open space. So what's important there is simply put your posture. Now, there are other bits and pieces that we talk about in other videos. But what I'm illustrating here, first and foremost, is the neutral head position. And this is the position that you need to be keeping your head for all of the activities I'm about to show you. And in brief, where it is, is it is where your ear is lined up level over the tip of your shoulder, just like this. So we all have the tendency to let the head turtle or stick forward like that. Whether we are typing on a computer, looking down at our phone, whether we're just having casual conversations with people, we have the tendency to look forward. I do in practice as well. All of the world is designed where we are leaning forward, extending the head forward like that. And the problem with that is that your head, which normally is going to weigh somewhere around 8 to 10 pounds, every inch that it goes forward, the effective weight and stress and strain down through your shoulders, down to your low back, is going to double. Therefore, the first step is making sure that we are actually keeping our head in the right position and the right orientation as much as possible when we are doing these activities. And it's not where I'm looking up at the ceiling, see, yep, my head's even over my shoulders. No, that's cheating. It's where your chin is tucked in like this. So, you keep your eyes level, and I oftentimes would say this is not unlike, okay, wear your glasses like your grandmother. Lower them down over the brim of your nose. You don't actually have to do this, but you'd be able to see that vertical brim right there. That brim needs to stay level with the horizon. So you're not tipping your head back, and you're not tucking your head down all the way, per se. It's just keeping everything level, just like that. And that's actually the first exercise there, what we call tin chucks or chin tucks. This can be done either against a wall, against a chair, or upright standing. It doesn't matter. But simply put, what we do is we bring the head straight back over the shoulders and bring the chin in. Not chin down, not chin up, just chin straight back. And we hold that position for two minutes. A great time to do this is when you are brushing your teeth, specifically if you're using an electric toothbrush. Why is that? Well, it's because, I mean, it's kind of hard to do that if you're doing it manually like this, but with the electric toothbrush, the toothbrush is doing the work for you. So you can maintain, keep your lips closed so that you're not blasting toothpaste all over the place, but what you do by pulling your head back like that, that vibration and keeping your head in that position will actually activate all of those muscles in and through the back of your neck and also reduce the stress and strain on the muscles on the front of your neck. And you want to be able to ideally hold that position for, as we said, two minutes, which guess what? It's the exact same time that you are brushing your teeth. So if we can take any activity that you're already doing and tie it into something new rather than have to recreate the wheel, my opinion, that oftentimes works better, somewhat easier to implement. Now, again, you don't have to be doing this activity when you're brushing your teeth. You're doing this at any point throughout the course of the day so that you can get best benefit. So that's going to be exercise number one. Exercise number two, these are what we're calling bobbleheads. We see all the time where people say, oh, it feels like I just need to stretch my neck or stretch my shoulders, something like that off to the side. But what people don't realize that they're doing is they're actually jamming the joints up. And yes, it sometimes might release and sometimes might feel good for all of about mm, 20 seconds. But the problem is, is that if it ever releases in that way, it's usually because you've got excessive movement through the areas that are already moving too much rather than releasing to the areas that actually need it. In addition, it causes the joints of your neck to jam lock against each other, which means that it's not actually producing any true benefit whatsoever. 
So instead, what I advocate is what we said are the bobblehead exercises. So what is a bobblehead? Well, a bobblehead doll is a little something that moves like this. So from the front and then from the side. So if and when you need to, you feel the muscles are tightening up. Okay, the first thing you need to do is tin chuck. Make sure that your head is in that nice neutral position. The second thing that you'll do then is you're going to pretend that you are in a very, very high set collar like this. In other words, it is impossible for you to move your neck. In the same way we'd say, okay, this right here, there's my head joint, so right up at the top. And then this down here, my elbow represents this little part here at the base of your neck. So what we are not going for, we are not going for this, where all the movement is occurring here. So no, the head stays over the shoulder like this. And then what we're going to be doing, just about an inch or so up and down, slow and controlled, is just nodding. Like this. And yes, you will get some movement through your neck. It's inevitable, but it's about where that movement is originating from. You need to imagine that the movement is coming from right here at your ear, that that is the pivot point like that. Now, what that's going to do is that's going to facilitate normal motion through all of the joints of your neck, which are oftentimes going to be locking up in a way that's not going to cause further injury, jam lock, or anything like that. Now, a lot of times people want to know, oh, okay, can I also do the same thing side to side and can I do it with rotation? I don't necessarily recommend it, especially with rotation, because you're more likely than not to actually just make yourself dizzy in the process. And so instead, I just advocate the up and down. That is usually more than sufficient in order to release the tension through these areas here. How many should you do? Five to ten. No more than that. And the key is also slow and controlled to make sure that you're doing them from the right place, right position. And this is an as needed kind of activity, just getting some of that general mobility, assisting with your flexibility there. Now, as a bit of a side comment here, a lot of times people want to know, okay, well, if I'm having neck pain, should I get one of those soft collars to support my head? And I don't recommend those unless you, of course, have you know, fractured something, you've been you know, given it direct by the ER and say, wear this for the next six weeks. And the reason for it, we know that expression. If you don't use it or you abuse it, you lose it. So when we wear a collar around the neck, what we found through the research is that the muscles can actually start to decondition. And if the muscles are deconditioned, that's the whole point of this video. It means that you're more likely to experience relapses and different kinds of injuries, the exact same thing that you're trying to actually prevent. So far better that we're actually trying to maintain the head over its normal position on top of your shoulders just where it should be right there. So, those are my thoughts on the soft collars. And that was also then the end of exercise number two, the bobbleheads. Now, exercise number three. This is the relaxation exercise. In its simplicity, this is one of the very best exercises that I think you can do, not just for your neck, but really for your entire spine. I'll admit, I'm guilty. I've never done yoga in my life. But the benefits of it, because it enhances full body flexibility, are massive. And at the end of every yoga session, they do what's called a shavasana, aka corpse pose, where all you're doing is literally lying flat on your back on the floor, nothing under your head and without bending your knees. Why? It's because what that does is that elongates and allows everything with just the force of gravity to be able to stretch and to relax. And it's not uncommon when people do that exercise for the very first time, they think, wow, I really feel it pulling, stretching down through my back or between my shoulders. Well, that's actually, that's the whole point. If those muscles have contractured, they've gotten physically short over a period of time, guess what? They need the opportunity to be able to relax and to release. And that can only be done over a period of time. In the same way, if you try to stretch a piece of paper, if you try to do it too fast, you're going to tear it. But if you do it slow and controlled, you can actually produce stretch over a period of time. And because this is a stretch that's done for long-term benefit, you take your time with this one here. And I'll show you, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But you can do this either with nothing under your head, or I actually recommend one of these devices. I get no endorsements, I get no kickback, 
But this is a, an example of a, a cervical orthopedic device where what it does is it supports the normal curve of your neck, but it is soft enough that it's not going to be producing excessive strain and resistance. My own neck is very, very finicky. And so a lot of the different devices that are out on the market, they're trying to produce too much stretch too fast. And if you are producing too much stretch too fast, then what did we say? It produces resistance. If there's resistance, that's not actually going to produce the relaxation and enhance the flexibility that you're actually trying to achieve. So instead, we recommend one of these here, again, a cervipedic or a cervipedic neck relief device that you just simply you put under your head while doing the activity. You don't need it, but that's the one that I like the most. And I will show you how the exercise is done. And it is really remarkably simple. You lie flat on your back, on the floor, just like this, arms down to your side. If you are needing a lot of attention, you need stimulation, yes, you are allowed to look at your phone, you're allowed to read a book, but ideally you're just simply put lying there. And if you are using one of these devices, as we said, it just simply goes under your neck like this. Now to increase the stretch, what you would do, you'll see that what I'm doing with my feet here is I'm actually pointing my toes up toward the ceiling. Why is that? My feet actually have the tendency to point straight down like this. And that's part of what produces the various bits of tension through my body. But when we stretch the feet up, toes to the ceiling like that, lying in this position, what it does is it actually will enhance that overall stretch through the body. And then we just simply put, we lie there like that for a period of time. Question is, how much time should we actually be doing that for? Well, ideally 13 minutes, and I recommend lying down on the job. What do I mean by that? A recess break. That it would be in the middle part of the day, not right when you've just woken up, not right before you're about to go to bed in the evening, but in the middle part of the day between activities where you are most active. Now, I get it. You're not going to be able to always do that. So you do the best that you can. The therapeutic value happens between about 8 to 13 minutes. So that's how long you ideally would be shooting for here. Now, as I also said, because many times people will experience pulling down to the low back to the point where it can actually be extremely uncomfortable. And of course, if you're experiencing vertigo, dizziness, or other problems when you're lying down kind of position, you may need to be able to build into this one here. So even though this is a very simple exercise, if you're experiencing problems, do not underestimate, excuse me, do not overestimate the challenge that can put on your body. So what I recommend is that you start at two minutes. Aim for two minutes, that's it. If you can't even do that, aim for 30 seconds. But if you can do two minutes, easy. Well, then tomorrow, aim for three. If you can do that, easy. Next day, aim for five, aim for eight, aim for 13. And so there you go. Beyond 13, the law of diminishing returns kicks in. And that is there's no additional real benefit. It's so subtle, you might as well just pull up stumps right there. Now, sometimes people do ask me, okay, wow, that feels really, really comfortable lying down on this. Can I sleep on it? I don't recommend that, and it's because I have had a few people fall asleep while using these before. Some people, no harm, no foul. But other times, even that little bit of the curve is enough, again, over that long period of time for, to produce that extra resistance. And that, unfortunately, is what actually goes uh, counterproductive, and it ends up pulling their body out of alignment. And so I repeat that you want to do this slow and controlled. So there we have three very basic exercises that work on flexibility, rest, and then also that core positioning activity that you need for any and all other kinds of physical activities that you're going to do. I repeat, no matter what exercise you're doing, working on your core, in order for it to work, you have to make sure that your hip is properly aligned over the tips of your shoulders like this. If you're at the gym, if you're running or whatever, and your head's sticking forward like this, you lose all of that benefit right then and there. Now, when it comes to full spine flexibility, 
There's a basic exercise protocol that I do want to show you here as well, and it's called the five Tibetan rites. I was introduced to this probably three, four years ago as just a, a general way that you can wake up and get movement and flexibility through all parts of your body. In my opinion, yoga, again, is by far the best kind of activity for doing this. And this, in some ways, these are very, very basic yoga exercises. I repeat that even though some of these are very, very simple and can be done for people of all ages, you have to consider where you are starting out. So just because I'm going to show you these and think, okay, yeah, that looks relatively straightforward and simple, you'll notice I have somewhat limited flexibility myself. I need to take some of my own recommendations here as well. I'm human like anybody else. But in addition to that, have a chat with your chiropractor, your medical doctor, your physical therapist, your trainer, to find out if these are going to be appropriate for you first. But I'm going to show them to you one way or another here. So, five exercises that get general motion mobility through the various joints of your body and also facilitate a little bit of that basic core strength as well. So, exercise number one is done to stimulate your vestibular system. One of the major problems that we can have as human beings, as adults and as aging adults, is where our sense of balance starts to go off. So this is a way of waking that system up. You stand where there's going to be enough room with your arms out to your side to be able to make a full rotation. And what you're going to do is you are going to slow and control. You're going to look down at the floor, but do it this way. Again, we do not want you looking down at the floor like this. Do it with your eyes by looking first with your eyes, then tuck your chin, then if you still can't see your feet, then bring your head down just that little bit. That's actually the right way that we want to be looking down or turning our head 100% of the time. So we engage the neck muscles, look with our eyes, and then look down like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to rotate clockwise, looking straight down at the floor like this. And that's it. You're not trying to make yourself dizzy, but depending on your level of training, yeah, you could actually be feeling that little bit off balance. But that's actually part of the exercise. You need to train your brain to be able to know where your body is in open space. And if feeling that little sense of disequilibrium to be able to bring your body back to center. Why? Because if we lose the ability to do that, guess what? We're going to be more likely to suffer, to experience falls, physical injury, and all of the problems that go along with that. Now, you can start out, and I recommend doing it the same way. You start with just two of these to see if you can physically do it at all. If that's easy, well, then the next day, you do three. And five, 13, and in this particular case, there is no magic number. But there's no real, again, therapeutic benefit when we start going, you know, into 30 repetitions, 40 repetitions. So it would be more a matter when you get to maximum training is how many repetitions can you do slow and controlled in two minutes. So the entire protocol that I'm going to be showing you is going to be something that takes no more than about 10 minutes. So with these repetitions, and I repeat, you're not trying to make yourself a spinning top. How many times did I turn around in two minutes? No, 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 no. That's not what we're aiming for here at all. It is about slow control. And just going at whatever pace is comfortable for you. Because you can appreciate if you're 20 years old versus if you're 80 years old, you're probably going to want to do it a little bit different. Tailor it to your own needs. So that's the first one right there. The second one is where you're actually going to be working to engage your core muscles doing a bit of a jackknife kind of pose like this. So what you'll do is you'll come down onto the floor. And yes, you're allowed to use a yoga mat or a carpet if you want to make it just a, a little bit softer. But in brief, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be lying down on our back like this. And we're going to be making sure that we're keeping our head and our neck in that position that I'd shown you earlier. Slide a little bit more like this. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be activating the core muscles through your stomach. And you do that 
and scoop imaginingly your breathing in, pulling your belly button up towards your head. And as you do that, you're going to tuck your chin in and elevate like this. So you are going to be bringing your chin in first and then elevating your legs. Now, it's very important that you're not doing is you're not sticking your head forward like this. There's a big difference between this and that. So one of them, you're tucking the chin in first and then pulling up. And as you pull up, that's the same point where you bring your legs as high as you can. If you can only bring them to here, that's fine. If you can bring them all the way up, if you're more flexible, and if you can bring more of your body up, that's also great. I'm just showing you where I am. And if you can only do it like that, a little bit off the floor like that, guess what? That's still going to engage those core muscles that you need right there. And so the same thing again, you're going to do however many reps feels comfortable for you. Now it's important, and I'm holding my hands up like this, not because you have to, but so that you can see that I'm not pushing up and making my arms do the work. You want your neck and then your abdomen and your legs to be doing that exercise for you without the hands. So that is exercise number two. Exercise number three. These are going to be where you're going to come up onto your knees like this, and you're going to be arcing and elevating, releasing things through your shoulders and also through your back. So what you're going to do on the knees, and it's important that your toes curl down like this. If you have to start this way, that's also all right. Again, start with where you are. Any of these can be modified for where you are starting. But the ideal, and this is very difficult for me to actually do, which is why I work on it, is where your toes are flexed up and curled like that. So you're on your knees, your spine is straight, you bring your hands down around your ankles. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be first arcing up toward the ceiling. Or ideally, this is going to be looking straight up like that. There is a variation where you can actually bring your arms up like that as well to enhance the stretch, but I'll just show you the basic version here first. So we come up like that, and then the opposite where we're going to slump forward down, kind of like that. Now do pay attention here. I'm not letting my head lead like this, then leading back. So again, we're keeping the head in that neutral position. That's what's essential for all of this to work in the first place. So the head is over the shoulders. It leads up. Head stays over the shoulders. And then it lumps down. And as we do that, we're going to be engaging and getting, as you can see, this arcing motion through our pelvis, through our shoulders, through our hips. Putting this up and down kind of neck. Just to get the general mobility. Even at this point, if you're noticing like, whoa, I feel like I'm breaking out a little bit of a sweat. Good, you're waking your body up. This is a perfect kind of a gentle routine where you can do that. So that one there, exercise number three. Exercise number four. This is where you're going to be engaging your shoulders and your hips. What you're going to do is you're going to come on your back side. You're plant your hands about where your hips are like this. And you'll have to fiddle with this one here just a little bit to get the, the right point in position here. Because what you're essentially going to be doing is you're going to be swinging your body like this. And ideally, it would be in a way where you're not having to sit down each and every time. So, what's going to happen is you're going to start like this. Heels planted on the floor. It doesn't really matter where your toes are. And what you're going to do is by swinging your hips forward, bending your knees, you're going to try to get as if your stomach, your chest are going to be flat. But again, only go as far as you can. Like that. 
and then you'll come down where your backside will slide between your hands, stretching your hamstrings, the back of your legs, through here. Yes, you can come all the way down into like the full sitting position, but it's actually better if there's that tiny little gap where that's actually engaged. And as you can see, I'm, st I'm using my arms to keep my body up like this. So what we're doing is we're actually going to be waking up shoulders and also hip while at the same time giving the opportunity to stretch the back of our hamstrings, stretch our back muscles, and also work on our upper arms as well by just maintaining our upper body strength and mobility. And that's the action right there. It does take a little bit of practice, a little bit of coordination. You have to find the hand position that feels comfortable. And if, of course, you've ever had shoulder injury, be sure you're not aggravating that old shoulder injury. The last exercise out of this series, then, is where we are going to be doing cat stretches, downward dogs. So this one here, again, even if you've never done yoga, you've probably seen this kind of stretch, and you understand it's important. So again, we're going to be planting our toes down on the ground, if we can, and if we can't, that's all right as well. And you're going to start kind of like this, where your legs are straight, hands, whatever position is comfortable, and butt going straight up in the air. Now what we're going to do is we're going to come down, arcing like this, looking straight up at the ceiling. And then we will reverse on that, coming up. And when you come up, it's not just a passive, okay, yep, I'm up. What you actually want to do is you want to take your back as far as you can to where you feel like you're getting a bit of a stretch through the back of your hamstring. So again, it's a way of creating stretch and flexibility through all parts of your body. But in a way that's designed to minimize the loading on the joints. And it's simply put, it's just back and forth like that. Again, there would be some textbook normal ways that you can be doing these. But for right now, it's just really getting the, the start. There's all kinds of different variations. But I figured I would just introduce the core concepts here, ways that you can be waking your body up and making sure that all the bits and pieces are getting that flexibility, that motion, that mobility to ultimately develop that strength and stability that you need again so that you can ultimately stay upright, maintain your alignment, maintain your correction, and be able to do the things that you want to do without always having to worry about your alignment going out of position. Good luck with these. All right, and thanks for watching that one. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please do click the like and subscribe button down at the bottom. It helps YouTube recognize that this is a valuable video so that other people can find this information here as well. If you're also thinking of friends and family who might really benefit from this kind of information, please do share this with them. And last but not least is if we've shown you something here and you think, okay, wow, I need to learn more information. What I'm going to ask you to do is go to my personal website, which is drjeffreyhanna.com, where we've got links to all kinds of other articles, videos, just like this one here, and talking about the different kinds of connect, uh, conditions that are oftentimes related to a little problem here at the upper part of your neck, things that people never realize are actually associated with that particular part of your body. And if you're looking then for care and ways that we can help, reach out to me. You've got my email on the, the website there. And alternatively, what you can do is you can go to BlairChiropractic.com if you are not in the uh, Spokane area so that you can find a Blair Upper Cervical Chiropractor closest to you. Now, if, of course, you're in the local area, relatively speaking, and are looking for help, what you do is you reach out to us. We're at clearchirospokane.com and you can call us direct at 509-315-8166. That number again, 509-315-8166. Thanks for watching the video. We look forward to hearing back from you. So until next time, this is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Clear Cairo Spokane. 
Get well, live well, and stay well. Take care. Bye-bye.